so welcome back everyone and uh welcome to our panel on uh how monsters work so the idea behind this panel is that we're doing something a little bit different to some of the other panels uh sort of rather than going for a sort of wider wider talk sort of theme i've asked these um people to introduce some monsters and how they work in their particular formats and settings as a way to kind of kick us off for some of the um, discussions and breakout groups for today. This panel will feature one game developer and two historians, um, Hannah Bayat, Sven Jins, and Tamara de Bruyne. And we will start, I think, with Sven Jins, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, working on the core project Homo Imperfectus, Animals, Machines, and the Quest for Humanity in Late Medieval France. He is the lead for design and development on a public engagement project called Monstrum, the Medieval Cooperative Board Game. Um, and among his side quests, he works on how medieval heritage finds its way into modern fantasy and science fiction. Sven, what monsters do you have for us today? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James. Let me just set up my presentation and share computer audio. Okay. So hopefully you should all be seeing my presentation now. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'll be going rather quickly through a couple of traits that many monsters have, both in medieval heritage and in modern games. And maybe that can help us get started on some discussion afterwards. So um, the way that I wanted to approach this is in a sort of listicle format. So. The three main traits that I'll be focusing on are primarily the monster is excessive in some way by its very nature. The second one is that monsters tend to inspire anxiety or dread in many situations. And the third one is that monsters are often alluring or seductive in some way. And the fourth one is one I'll go into all the way at the end of this little presentation. So the first example that I wanted to work with uh, to illustrate excess is the griffin. Griffins were popular in the Middle Ages. They weren't, uh, they were already invented prior to the Middle Ages as well, and they are still popular in games now. Griffins are defined by excess in the sense that they are not just one species, they are two species all in one. So there is the eagle, the king of birds in medieval thinking, and the lion, the king of all terrestrial animals. And both of these are unified in this one creature, in the griffin. Um, and that leads to a kind of excess of elemental properties, but also majestic properties. Because the griffin didn't really have a kingdom of its own, like the eagle or the lion. And so one of the sources of anxiety, at least for medieval people, was that it was a very aggressive creature, a very homicidal and territorial creature. As you can also see in the image to the right, which depicts a griffin sort of holding a limp human in its beak, uh, because griffins were said to be very uh, homicidal specifically, and they hated horses as well. This was introduced in Griffin law uh, by Isidore of Seville and taken over by bestiaries and by encyclopedias as well. Now, in games, griffins are usually presented in the same way as well as this eagle-lion hybrid, and they usually live in remote parts of the world guarding precious jewels and ensuring that no one can get near them. In The Witcher 3, it's a little bit different because you can encounter the griffin, or you definitely encounter the griffin very much at the start of the game already. Um, and it's one of the very first creatures that you have to kill. And that also brings me to the allure part. Um, because they live in these remote margins of the world, or because they are at the very beginning of a game, they are a kind of invitation to explore. If you enjoy killing the griffin in The Witcher, then you will probably enjoy the rest of the gameplay as well. In medieval times, though griffins were used as this sort of warning of the dangers that lurked at the edge of the world, at the same time that also presented a kind of invitation for um, establishing a kind of human mastery in these distant regions. At the same time, um, people also used griffins as a symbol of their own power. So griffins would surface in heraldry of kings uh, and aristocrats. Um, and there were also claims that people would fashion griffin claws or paws 
into these fancy wine chalices that they could drink from. Um, obviously, the chalices that are claimed to be made of griffins aren't actually made of griffins. They're made of um, antelope horns, I think, mostly, or ostrich eggs. Um, but people like to believe that they possessed some kind of griffin attributes in their homes. And in some games now, you still see this urge to possess the griffin. Um, one example is World of Warcraft, where the griffin has essentially been reduced to a kind of vehicle for the player to fly around on and travel around on. The, the nature or the wildness of the creature itself doesn't really matter anymore. Now, another example I wanted to go into is a humanoid sort of monster. And here, the demon seemed like a good example to use because it has all these traits as well. It, it is defined by excess. You see that in both the medieval depictions of demons and in the gamified depictions of demons. So usually they have body parts that shouldn't uh, be part of a humanoid body, uh, like this devil in this um, manuscript from Oxford. He has fishy scales on his skin. He has multiple heads on his body, even in his groin area, even heads on his head and horns as well. So there's an excess of different kinds of species involved in the physical appearance of this creature. In the Dragon Age games, you can also encounter demons. They are not so much a mashup of different creatures, except for the bear demon, I think, in the top right, which has these sort of spider-like um, paws coming out of its back and tentacles on its face as well. Now, this is usually one of the sources of anxiety that these creatures present. They look humanoid, but not entirely human. So they speak to this idea of the uncanny valley. Another reason for the anxiety or the, the threat that they can pose to players and to people reading about them is that they also present a kind of allure. They are usually sin personified or sin incarnate. And so in that sense, they present the dangers of what can happen if you give in to temptation, if you give in to unbridled power, and so on. So, this much for the first three traits, but the bonus trait that I promised to go into is actually my favorite one, and it seems a bit rarer in games, at least as far as I could think. Um, usually the player conquers the monster in some way. They kill them or they drive them away or they turn them to their side and there's this cute redemption arc or something. But rarely does the monster truly escape with its monstrosity still intact. And so for the final example, I wanted to go into the idea of the swarm, which is just one ordinary animal, but then amplified or becoming excessive because there are just too many of them to contain. And so this was something that frightened people both in the Middle Ages and has been used to quite upsetting effect, I would say, in modern games such as the Plague Tale games. Now, in the Middle Ages, the reason that these creatures were so scary or frightening was that um, swarms of rats or swarms of locusts or snails even would feast on the crops of people um, and eat their winter harvests, basically. And this drove people to despair. And in that despair, they would seek out the help of the church, who would sometimes even organize a veritable trial to determine whether or not the humans were guilty of sin and had therefore caused this plague themselves, or whether the um, animals were in fact an undue punishment for the people that had to be driven away. And in many cases, the trial did end with the creatures being ritually banished. So then they would hold a procession through the fields of these villages or, or surrounding these villages to drive away the creatures, hoping that that would finally relieve them of this swarm. In Plague Tale, it's a little bit different. Here, it's this huge horde of rats that brings the plague with them, but they can also eat people in just a matter of a few seconds. So there, there's this like sort of tsunami entity, especially in the second game that um, streams into cities and villages and just consumes everything it can get its little paws on. And one advantage that this game has, as opposed to medieval heritage, is that it has its sound included. So the rats also have a sonic identity in the sense that they make these chittering sounds that help you recognize that you are probably going to be in danger very soon. And they even have a musical theme of their own. So you uh, have a very distinct identity for these rats as a monstrous creature in the game. And to illustrate that, I wanted to show a short clip from the second game. Cook! 
of you is still in effect. Go back to your oaths. What's going on? Tell us the truth. Enough lies. No, run! All of you! No, no! So one other thing that mechanically is rather fantastic and also awful for me personally as a player about this is that you actually have to run from the rats and at first you don't see them, they're right behind you and you're running away from them, deeper into the screen if you will, and then it turns around at a certain point and the player is running with their avatar at the screen and the rats following them. I've always hated this in games but it's mostly because it's so effective at making me feel anxious or feeling stressed. Uh, so this is one sort of mechanical way in which the monster can become even more scary in an interactive format, in addition to the sound design and the other uh, aspects of the monster, such as its excessive nature in the sense of this huge rat-like wave. So um, that's all I have to say for now, and I'm happy to pass it on oops, to uh, the next speaker. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, can you unshare screen? Yeah, great. Um, okay, so uh, we now move on to our middle speaker. Uh, Hannah Bayat is a quality assurance analyst at Microbird Games in Vienna, uh, where she's worked on the upcoming title Dungeons of Hinterberg, a modern fantasy alpine adventure that mixes dungeon crawling and puzzle gameplay. Her work more widely has included a range of areas around software development, especially visual computing, which she holds a master's degree, uh, which has included development of health and food security applications uh, and academic work on medical imaging technologies. Um, and Hannah, um, please um, give us some monsters. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Let me just share my screen real quick. There we go. So yeah, um, as James, already, I hope you can see this. Um, um, as James already mentioned, I work at uh, Microword Games as a QA analyst, which means I play the game a lot. Um, I check for bugs. I um, I find bugs and give give them to other people to fix it. Um, and um, so I'm here to talk about our upcoming game, uh, Dungeons of Hinterberg, which is an action adventure RPG um, that takes place in the Austrian Alps. And um, yeah, basically the synopsis of this game uh, is um, it's about Luisa, um, a lawyer who um, is taking a break from her busy life in Vienna and um, has arrived in Hinterberg, where, where there's 25 dungeons and magic all over the place, um, which you get to crawl in. Um, so the, it's a bit of a bit of a dungeon crawler. Uh, you get to uh, get new magic skills in different areas. Um, and it's also a bit of a life simulation game where you can talk to the local locals and, and build relationships. But of course, um, most importantly, this game has also a bunch of monsters, um, which I'm here to talk about. Um, yeah, the monsters in Hinterberg are mostly based on uh, Austrian mythology and legends. So some of these might be um, might sound familiar to you. Um, we have something like the Zwerg, which looks a bit like this. Uh, Zwerg is the German word for dwarf. Um, it's, a, it's a super cute, in my opinion, but also kind of terrifying um, monster that rolls around and can damage you with a very, um, very aggressive roll and explosions. Um, we have kobolds, which is the German word for kobolds, um, and um, this one's a, a tiny one that can come out of every nook and cranny, really, and, and just attack you with, with its um, wooden stick, um, and it's a fun one to play with as well. And lastly, we also have a pert. Um, Pert, uh, to those who have grown up in Austria or have a connection to Austria, might uh, sound familiar because we have on the 5th of December, there's a tradition, um, which is, it's the Eve of St. Nicholas Day on the 6th of December. And on the 5th of December, people would dress up as Perts, mostly men getting drunk um, and then dressing us up, up as Perts and running through towns uh, or their local village area. 
um, and sometimes even kidnap people, uh, kidnap kids for fun, of course, um, nothing too crazy. Um, so um, the Pecht is also often uh, mentioned with the Krampus, which is quite famous around the world, um, both quite scary creatures, um, very tall and big monsters. Um, and, and this way the Pecht has also made it into our game since it is taking place in the Austrian Alps, of course. So we're drawing uh, a lot from Austrian mythology. There's, however, two uh, monsters that I want to go into detail with uh, that I personally have a strong connection with and, and really love or have come to love. Um, one of which is the Pitzel, which looks something like this. So in the top right, you can see a picture of it um, as it is uh, in the game. And this Pitzel is based on a legend from, the 1860, from 1861 written by Johann Nepomuk von Alpenburg, who was an Austrian author. Um, and um, it's supposed to be this sort of small imp uh, living in the upper Inn Valley. So the Inn is a river in Tyrol, which is the um, red area on the map on the top, on the bottom right that you can see. And the Inn is sort of the, the river that goes through Innsbruck as well, the capital of Tyrol. Um, and so sort of in the upper area of that is where the pits lives. Um, and the pits has been sort of really uh, well defined in these legends. Um, in contrary to other uh, monsters that I will talk about as well. Um, but the Pizza is, is, is described as this small and playful house ghost um, in, a, in a form of a dwarf. Um, and I think what we've done so well here, it's also described as a kid with an old head. And if you look at the picture, I think it's really captured this kid with an old head um, sort of uh, characteristic. And I think we've done that so well. Um, to integrate that that character into our game. Um, th this Pitzel is supposed to also play a bunch of pranks um, in the legends, one of the, which is a, is a prank where he, um, or it, I guess, um, places a bowl of milk in front of a door so people would step into it. And whenever someone would fall for their pranks, they would they would laugh laugh in this sort of giggling manner uh, in a very long and sort of high-pitched laugh which is something um, that in our game you will see um, is, is, is very present. So our sound department has done a really, really great job of taking that, um, that little description really in the, in, the, in the legends, but making it so characteristic for this Pitzel character um, that, that whenever you hear it, you're like, you, you, start, you start getting anxious about it. Um, and, and what I love about these Pitzels as well is that We've taken this, this story and, and the little sort of clues of what we had, but our artists and the game designers and, and our coders and, and the sound department have made it such a, a great sort of uh, coherent character and monster um, that it's really fun to, to beat. And, and they have this uh, locking attack that I'll, I'll show you in just a bit that makes you hate them with a passion, which I also always love whenever you have a character in game that you're like, I hate you with a passion, but you make the game so great. And, and if you think Dungeons of Hinterberg without the Pitzel, it doesn't quite work. Um, so it's it's really one of my favorite monsters. And I think around the office, um, I, I have some people that share this opinion with me. Um, so we do have, since the game is in early develop or in development, um, I can't share too much about it, but we do have a sort of very small short video that I hope you will be able to see a bit. I will try to, um, wait before I before I let the sound talk here. Okay, so you can see hopefully on this very small image um, that the 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 pixels have these sort of um, the sort of projectiles that they um, that they shoot you with the the little ones that are bouncy a little, and then this spinning attack that it really um, can get you. Um, really bad sometimes, um, and it's really fun to fight them. Really, so uh, you'll have you'll have different monsters in a in an encounter, and then when, whenever a pixel shows up, you're like, okay, now now the game is on, and uh, now I have to take out my uh, my skills here. Um, so I'll leave this for one more round, so you can have a bit of a look. I hope you can see it. Unfortunately, it's only in in the in the phone aspect. But um, yeah, moving on to another monster that we have in our game, uh, which we call the Hobangos. Um, 
depending on where you are in in austria or south germany bavaria there's varying interpretations of the hubangoas and also um different spellings so some call it the haba guys and um as i mentioned the percht before this hubangoa is supposed to be according to legends a percht's pet um so you will also in in the in the tradition of the percht run see these hobangos alongside the perts running through villages um and and kidnapping kids every now and then um in a in a fun manner of course um, and hobangos have this um have this um saying that when, once you spot one it's a bad omen for you and um they are described as these tall goats um with horse feet which is uh a nice sort of uh, uh, circling back to what Sven was saying. It's a mixture of two animals, um, and it's, it's people would dress up as these hobangos in the in the Percht runs um, with a mask, like you can see on the bottom right. Uh, this was actually one that you can buy online, apparently, and um, they have they, they they would dress up in a way so they would stick up um, a stick into this these masks so they appear very tall, and um, these Hobangos are very terrifying in the legends as well. However, in my personal opinion, in our in our game, I think they're quite cute. Um, and I've gotten that response from playtesters as well who have who have tested the game a bit um, to give us some feedback that, that they are quite cute. Um, but I guess they can be quite terrifying looking at how they how they have some some really bad attacks. But again, I think with the Hobangos, we we have we have taken something that is very Austrian, and and it even though there are varying interpretations, sometimes it is described as a bird-like creature. We've taken that one, we've stuck with it, and um, and interpret and integrated into the game really well with different mechanics that work so so great, um, and and make it a really distinct uh, monster in our game. And um, here again, I have um, I have the a video. Also, again, very um, short and in phone format. So I hope you know it's somehow um, seeable. Um, but yeah, you can see um, if you pay close attention to it that uh, it's stuck. It sticks its head um, into the ground. So you can see it right here, and then appears somewhere else again, which I think is beautiful. Um, in, in its own way, because I've never seen it in any game really. Um, but um, it also it also sort of integrates this bad omen kind of thing. I think you see it, and then it sort of this uh, appears somewhere else. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a really cool character in my opinion, and it has also this again sound wise we've sort of hit the mark, and um, you can you can hear a goat in the background uh, whenever it appears. And um, yeah, it's just it's just really fun to fight it. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can you can add me at, at Hanisaurus on Twitter or all other social media. Or contact me um, on the via email address. Or if you want to stay up to date with Microbird Games and what we're doing with Dungeons of Hinterberg, um, there's a there's a link. Uh, it's at Microbird Games on the social media platforms and uh, DungeonsofHinterberg.com uh, on our website. Yeah, so uh, thanks for everyone's attention. And um, I'm giving the mic to Tam Tamara. Yes, thank you. So uh, our last speaker for this panel is Tamara de Bruin is a research master's student in medieval literature at the University of Groningen. Her research focuses on treason and literary propaganda around the wars of Scottish independence and on the way that popular medieval narratives use animalistic natures or characteristics as strategies to dehumanize their subjects. She is also currently involved in the design and development of Monstrum on, alongside Sven. Tamara, the floor is yours. Yes, can you guys hear me? <laughs> yes. Awesome. Okay, um, hi uh, everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the monstrous female or monstrous femininity because um, uh, working on bestiaries, uh, you discover that a lot of the, the 
evil qualities of, of monsters or of animals are um, in women or in the female characters. So, uh, and you can't discuss female uh, representation in games, I feel, without looking at Medusa or at Gorin. So, uh, yeah, let's do that. Um, Gorons and snakes and spiders, anything of that like that uh, is of course scary. And I will show some uh, pictures of uh, monsters in games, which are can be quite gory. They tend to be on the horror side. So if you don't like that, um, do skip away because there's quite some boobage as well. It's it, it's all ingrained in the in the monstrous feminine. Um, so it's alright to be to not feel comfortable with that. Um, but yeah, these, uh, what I want to talk about are female monsters, particularly the Gorgons and the Broodmothers from Dragon Age, and how um, their animal uh, properties, their, anim their visual and physical properties, uh, yeah, dehumanized properties essentially, contribute to a grotesque form of femininity, and how, how that really makes one entire monster. How it emphasizes the monstrosity of the feminine in a way. Um, and I want to start with this little example of uh, Medusa from the Clash of Titans uh, movies. Uh, on the left, you see the 1981 uh, depiction and the remake from the 2010. And both of these are uh, Gorgons, uh, as you can see by their hair, they're Medusa. Um, and they have, they have a snake like body from the waist down. Uh, however, you can see the difference in the depictions, and uh, both of these will uh, have a different effect on the viewer. In, in a game, uh, how they look, if they look more human, uh, they will have a different effect on you than whether they are nearly entirely monstrous or de demonic, as you see in the old one. Um, a lot of people say that, uh, oh, you know, Clash of Titans did it first with the Medusa as uh, an entire snake. Um, but the Greeks did it first, in, 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 uh, in essence. Uh, there was the Lamia, who was originally a woman who went mad after losing her children, uh, and she became bestial after abducting and killing other children. She's often said to, to have a, the behind of an ass, or a horse, or a snake. Uh, there's no images of uh, the woman as a snake, uh, but, well, it's, uh, it was already a theme. And this theme we see in uh, other medieval tales as well. Uh, particularly in medieval Europe, you had uh, the, the snake woman um, Melusine. She was also depicted as a mermaid. It really depends on the tale and on the artistic interpretation, if you will. Uh, this is one of the oldest ones. Uh, it's about um, uh, a, a king who meets Pressine, a uh, fae. Uh, and when he meets her, he's not allowed to... Uh, there's one, fight, one uh, fatal condition. He's not allowed to see her uh, birth her children or bathe her children. Um, but he does sneak a peek, and uh, for that, he, not he is punished, she leaves, um, and so she retreats back to the outskirts. And uh, Melusine, one of her daughters, uh, born to King Elinus, um, wants to take revenge on her father for doing that, as his uh, digression removed her from court. This is not... Uh, taken kindly from by her mother, so she is condemned to live as a snake woman. And in this, uh, Melusine is transformed for um, her, her trade, her monstrous trade, if you will, her revenge, is uh, becomes an outside monstrosity, the snake tail. Um, and we see this again in the story when uh, she herself gains a husband. Um, he's not allowed to sneak a peek to see, to see her bathe on Saturdays, because that's when she turns into a snake. It's a whole transformation thing. Uh, but he does, and it's not he who's punished for the fatal condition. It is she. She turns into a, into a dragon and only returns to her children to feed them, to nurse them. Uh, and that's it. It's quite a... There's more, there's more stories um, about it, but essentially the woman is punished gets turned into a snake, so this monstrosity uh, becomes an outside deformity, if you will. Yes. And this deformity we see a lot in games, uh, and it's because it's quite monstrous. Um, I have a few examples from the God of War series, uh, who used the Medusa image, so the Gorgon with the snake heads, uh, as well as the, the Laumia or Melusine, um, image with the snake as a body. 
Um, these Gorgas and God of War have as, as a backstory that they are women who were beautiful, uh, but committed infidelity. And for that reason, they were punished. Um, and as a breed, as a breed of punished women, essentially, they, um, they now roam temples and other places that you, as the main character is Kratos, uh, find and kill. You're meant to kill them. They're always the enemy and they're always, um, well, out to kill you. Uh, they have, uh, like the Gorgon Medusa, they can petrify you and you are meant to rip the head off and use their head as a weapon to petrify others. Uh, lest you forget their feminine, uh, their female monsters, originally, these are all female monsters, uh, you see their breasts. And you see that again in God of War Ascension, a later game, uh, these are still monsters, they grow even more monstrous essentially as they have cobra heads. Um, but lest you forget, these were women who were punished for their sensuality. Uh, they have uh, the, upper, the upper torso of a, a woman, much like you see in the medieval depictions of Melusine. However, there are also different kinds, and this is where the territory gets a little bit mon a little more monstrous, monstrous um, as you also have snake women who are mothers, which is far worse than just being a snake woman. Uh, in this case, this is um, Uriel, also uh, from Greek mythology, essentially, uh, who is described as being morbidly obese, um, having green skin, fat, sagging breasts, and, uh, well, punishing, and she is out to punish Kratos for uh, not only punishing, not only killing her sister, but uh, for killing her brood, her children. She is uh, monstrous in all types of ways, not just in depiction, but also in the fact that she um, is ugly, essentially. <sighs> Okay, I should maybe give a trigger warning for this. This is the brood mother. Um, so where Uriel is still a snake woman, a gorgon, and very ugly. Um, she is evil, you must defeat her. Um, and you kind of want to because she is um, vile and monstrous, animalistic. She's more animal than woman. This goes for the brood mother as well, except for the fact that these monsters, as you see them with their... Um, uh, gross, their multiple sagging breasts and their uh, tentacle-like uh, limbs. These were once human women or humanoid women who um, were violated themselves. So they did not commit a violation. It was uh, done upon them and they paid a price uh, for that. Uh, if you ever played during uh, Dark Souls, Dark Souls, did I say it's Drain Age, right? That's my best. <laughs> Anyway, um, there's this, when you enter their lair, which is like fleshy and womb-like, you uh, encounter, encounter these monstrous, uh, these, fe these feminine monstrous, monsters, um, and you learn that they were once women who then became um, brood mothers through cannibalism and uh, eating blood of the darkspawn, <clears throat> or and if eating flesh and through cannibalism and through bodily fluids they become the monster they consume and through the, their consummation they turn into something far less than human and are reduced to being literal brood mothers for uh, the dark entities that you fight the dark creatures that you fight the dark spawn in the, in the game and this is you know it's, it's excessive. Everything about these creatures is excessive. Where first there was only the sexualized uh, woman being punished. This is now a woman who is uh, punished in bodily transformations, uh, but also in the fact that she's becoming a mother at the hands of violations. You see this a lot in uh, many games that um, are not, in, not just in games, in literature as well, in which um, Women, female characters, become monstrous by, of course, uh, by behaving in excess, whether they are uh, sexually promiscuous or whether they um, grow enraged, in the case of uh, brute mothers. And they are so dehumanized in their appearance, uh, they're so 
far from what women ought to be, essentially. Uh, they're animalistic, they're animal creatures. It, it, it becomes their out, outright uh, image. And it's so disgusting that, you know, you have to defeat them. You can never choose their side. Um, even if you feel like, oh, these, these are wrong creatures, you can never do that. It's always you're meant to encounter them and kill them. Uh, and what do these creatures represent? Is it uh, a male fear of castration, as Freud once said, or is it, um, in the case of the Brutmuller specifically, is it a fear of, you know, being reduced to uh, solely your uh, body parts, essentially? Um, that's a, it's, it's, I'm very curious how other uh, gamers uh, encounter uh, how female creatures and, and monsters and how uh, how any of this maybe is reflected in those as well because these are quite monstrous in the fact that they are animal and women at the same time which is one to, what I wanted to look into so I'd like to open the floor I guess great thank you um, yeah thank you for three really fantastic talks that was uh, um, <laughs> incredibly diverse and exciting uh, bunch of different um, creatures and terrors to be introduced to. So yes, we can now open the floor to questions.